It's kind of the same assumptions we went over when we did two population confidence intervals, right? Um, so it's going to be basically your categorical data assumptions for a proportion. Uh, if you're doing one or two proportions, the assumptions are about the same. So our assumptions, let's, let's do that. Assumptions. So our assumptions, we want, of course, uh, usually two simple random samples would be nice. So we want random samples. So two random samples would be good. Um, we would like, uh, um, we would like to know, uh, they would like the individuals in, within the samples and between the samples to be um, independent of each other. So individuals within and between the samples. to be independent of each other. So again, what we're looking for with that one is a tricky one, but we don't want any, like, we don't want people that are related to each other because they might have the same characteristics. So we're trying to, trying to avoid that if possible. Usually, again, a member of a small random sample out of a large population usually passes independence. So usually what we look for is our population size at least 10 times larger than our sample size. That's one way you can kind of try to judge it. But you also have to really think about it. You know, is there any relationship uh, with, between the people uh, in, in the data and between the data sets? Uh, three, we need both data sets to have at least 10 successes. So if you're using this uh, formulas where x1 has to be greater than or equal to 10 and x2 has to be greater than or equal to 10. And now we need both data sets to have at least 10 failures. Okay, both data sets should have at least 10 failures. All right, so that, and if you're using the, 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 the traditional symbols, usually in stat books, you'll see that as n1 minus x1 has to be greater than or equal to 10, and uh, n2 minus x2 has to be greater than or equal to 10. Um, again, there's other ways actually of doing this. Um, so you could also deal with, um, so what we call the, how many, how many do you expect to get? Do you expect to get more than 10? A lot of times uh, there's another formula that's sometimes used before you collect the data. Like if you want to try to figure out, am I going to get at least 10 if I, you know, if I, if I collect data from 75 people? Is that going to be enough for me to get 10 people that smoke? You know, so you'll see, sometimes you'll see other ones, other formulas, um, like um, this one. Uh, and, and, so sometimes you'll see this, n1, p1, n1 times p1 is greater than or equal to 10, uh, n1, n2, p2 is greater than or equal to 10, um, or this one, the failure, sometimes you'll see it as n1, 1 minus p1, or 1 minus pi1 um, is greater than or equal to 10, and n1, 1 minus p, n2, 1 minus p2 is greater than or equal to 10. Again, these are sort of formulas. I, I like to think of these, if I've already collected the data, and I've already seen that I got, I got way over 10 successes in both data sets and 10 failures, I think I'm good to go. Uh, I like to think of these formulas, I use these usually before I collect the data, just to see if I'm, if I'm collecting enough, and I'm gonna, before I ever start, I want to know if I'm going to get 10, you know? So what am I, what is the number am I shooting for in my sample sizes? So some, these are sometimes used. By the way, again, you could use um, the population percentage here, um, if, if, um, or if you had an idea of what it was. Uh, or you could use a sample percentage if you kind of had an idea what the sample percentage might be. Um, again, this is where this gets kind of tricky. Um, I, I kind of just like to see is it 10 successes and 10 failures. So, yeah, don't, don't worry too much about that. Did I have, 
at least 10 people that smoke in my both data sets and did I have at least 10 people that don't smoke in both my data sets. Okay. Now, uh, let's go. We got null and alternative hypothesis. We got type of data assumptions. Let's get to our test statistic. So what test statistic are we going to use? Well, what did we use for one population proportion, right? We use the Z test statistic, right? The, the, the standard normal distribution with a Z test statistic counting how many standard errors. So now what you're getting at is sort of this idea, same idea, but instead of saying how many standard errors is my sample proportion from this population proportion in the null hypothesis, now we're really comparing the two. So usually what you're kind of getting at is how many standard errors is the sample difference from zero, or as I like to think of it, is how, how, how many standard errors are my sample proportions apart. Now you can go, it doesn't have to be zero necessarily, I could have more advanced kinds of hypothesis tests, but uh, the, the basic one is, is usually zero, and that's the one I'm kind of covering today. So the, we're going to be using the Z test statistic, right? the Z test statistic. Same one we did for one population. All right, so let's look at our Z test statistics, see what we got there. So we're going to use the Z test statistic. That means when I'm looking up critical values, I, I'll be using uh, the, the standard normal distribution, one that we've covered over and over again. So the Z test statistic will be our test, but again, this is going to be a two population now. So the sentence, the explanation is a little bit different. So it's going to count, so it's going to tell me how many standard errors, so how many standard errors the sample proportion for group one or sample one is above or below the sample proportion for group two or sample sample two. So notice again number of standard errors, right? Number of standard errors, that's the key. Z and T score test statistics is all about number of standard errors. Okay, so um, and this time, think of it as how many standard errors apart is my P1 hat from my P2 hat, right? Now we learned before that when the Z test statistic comes out positive, that's telling you that group 1 is actually um, above. So if our Z test statistic comes out positive, we know it's above, uh, P1 is above P2, P1 hat is above P2 hat, and uh, if it's below, it's negative. So very similar to the one population sentence, except it's comparing P1 hat to P2 hat instead of P hat to pi, right? In the one population, we had just a number for the null hypothesis. So the formula for this, um, again, don't, it's not really a big deal. Um, the computers are going to calculate these formulas. Uh, it's more of the sentence is actually the most important, okay? Remember, computers calculate. Data scientists, statisticians, we explain. We know when the formulas and how the formulas work. We understand them, but we still have computers calculate them for us, right? And I want you to keep that in mind. So the basic idea is you take your sample from group one. So your sample proportion for group one. minus the sample proportion for group two and then we, we're going to divide by the standard error, right? The standard error. Now here's where we get into a little bit of an interesting change, okay? Now, if you guys remember, standard error calculation for two population confidence intervals involved using P1 hat and P2 hat, okay? And that is correct. But in two population 
um, proportion hypothesis test, we are assuming in the null hypothesis that the populations are equal. That allows us to do a little tricky technique. It's called pooling. Pool, I guess it comes from the name pooling, throwing everybody in the same pool. So we're pooling. Pooling means putting your data sets together. If you put your data sets together, you get one big data set. And what did we, what's kind of the overarching principle that I've been going on and on about with you since the start of class? is this idea that the bigger the data set, the bigger the random data set, the less error, right? So it just makes a little bit of a correction in your standard error, makes your standard error slightly more accurate for the test. It's really not a big deal. Um, even if you use the, the same standard error formula we use for confidence intervals, it's not really going to change the numbers a whole lot. But we might as well do it correctly. So pooling, what is pooling? All right. Well, pooling is uh, basically putting these together. So we call this p-pooled. I'm going to write it down down here. P-pooled. P-pooled. Sometimes looks like a p with a bar over it. When you see that in a formula, it just means you're putting the data sets together. So I'm going to count how many smokers were in the first data set plus the number of smokers in the second data set and then divide by the total sample size if I combine the two samples together. So it's basically like putting the two data sets together and then calculating the sample proportion. So they use that in the formula for standard error instead of the regular P1 hat and P2 hat. Now one thing to keep in mind guys in a computer program if they ask you to pool it's okay to pool on a two population proportion hypothesis test. It's not okay to pool on a two population confidence interval. Okay, so don't pool on confidence intervals because in that case we don't know in the null hypothesis that the two populations are actually equal. We're assuming they're equal in the null hypothesis. So that's what allows us to pool. Um, all right, so what does our formula look like? The computers are going to again going to calculate these formulas. But our formula would look like this. We're going to go P1 hat minus P2 hat. Sometimes you'll see the formula is minus zero there. Okay, you can do that. Divided by the standard error, square root of P pooled 1 minus P pooled over N1 plus P pooled 1 minus P pooled over N2. And that's our standard error estimation formula using the pooled approach instead of using the original P1 hat and P2 hat. Um, again, uh, the computer calculates.